Uh, the page numbers are there. So in the English Bible, it's on page 414. In the Spanish Bible, page 369. I'm not going to try and say that in Spanish. But hopefully you can find that. I'll give you a minute. All right, in Job chapter 19, uh, Job is speaking with his friends who have now showed up. If you were here last week, Pastor Felix kind of introduced this. And uh, Job went through a lot of suffering. And so some of his friends show up to try and help him and comfort him. And we see in chapter 19, Job's response to those friends. Starting in verse 23, he says, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Yeah. Let me pray real quick. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder in Job of um, even in the midst of suffering where our hope comes from. I just pray this morning as I speak that it would not be me, but it would be you speaking through me. Fill me with your spirit, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So just want to give a couple of updates. Um, in case you're new and you don't have any idea who I am, um, I was a member of this church for the past almost 20 years. Um, and then last year in uh, October, November, um, got the call to go and be youth pastor at a church called Crossbridge, not too far from here. And so Christina and I uh, moved over to that church in November of last fall and uh, have been working on rebuilding the youth group there, which has been a fun experience, a little bit different than what I've been doing for the past uh, almost 15 years now um, with Youth for Christ, uh, which is also going well, by the way. would love to stick around after the service and share with you some of the things that God is doing in Youth for Christ here in Miami. It's been a really exciting year for us, especially um, in the ministry that I'm a part of, Campus Life, where we go on to school campuses We've been able to start some new ministries at different schools, which has been a fun thing to be a part of. Um, also, uh, a little update on my mom, because I know many of you know her and care a lot about her. Um, so I thank you a lot for your prayers and uh, texts and emails and letters and all those things. Um, we really appreciate them. She's doing well. She's at home, um, just recovering, uh, getting her strength back. Um, she was in the hospital. She ended up in the hospital last week. Thursday, in case you don't know what's going on, um, my mom has some pretty major health issues that have been going on for the last 22 years, uh, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, started in 1998, um, and it actually ties really well into the, the sermon today, so I'm going to start there um, as we open. Um, you know, my mom being in the hospital again just brought back um, a lot of the things that have been going on with our family for the past 20 years or so. Um, initially, we actually moved from California to Miami because of my mom's health issues, because she was sick enough that um, she couldn't really work full time at the school that she was at there, and so they just didn't offer her a job. And so we moved to Miami so that my mom could continue to work and our family could continue to make ends meet, um, which was a difficult transition in many ways, but it was also great because we found South Kendall and we love it here. Um, but over the past 22 years, as my mom's health issues have progressively kind of gotten worse over time slowly, um, there's been many times where I found myself praying to God and just being like, God, why is this happening to my mom? Like, if you know my mom, she's one of the sweetest people. She loves God tremendously. She prays for people all the time. Like, I look up to her as kind of a model of a lot of times what a Christian should be. Not that she's perfect, um, but I think she's pretty awesome. And so over the years, you know, again, I've prayed to God many times saying, God, you know, why is this happening to my mom? Why don't you just heal her? Do a miracle. You're, you're the God of miracles, right? Just heal her and take this away and give her her health back so she can do all the things that she used to do that she enjoyed and she loved doing. And unfortunately, over the last 22 years, that hasn't happened. Um, and that's, that's a struggle. Like many of us go through, through suffering and through trials in life. 
Um, you know, we still get the South Kendall emails, and so this past week, as we were reading our email, we saw some of the suffering that's even happening here at South Kendall with people losing their parents, um, health issues that are going on. There's a lot of suffering that happens in our lives, right? And so there's a question that always comes up when we're facing suffering or when those close to us are facing suffering. So what question is it that we always ask when we're facing suffering in life? Somebody yell it out. Why God, right? We ask that question of why God? That's always the question that comes to mind, right? Because the Bible tells us that God is sovereign, he's in control, that he loves us and cares for us. So why is this happening? Why are these things happening in our life? And so I love the fact that I get to preach on Job. Job is a really interesting book in the Bible um, because it addresses the topic of suffering in a really tangible way, right? When we read through the story of Job, I don't know if you've been reading through Job um, this week as the series started, but Job faced a tremendous amount of suffering, probably more suffering than anybody here has ever faced. I mean, if you read the first couple of chapters of Job, we see that Job loses everything. At the end of the first couple chapters of Job, within the span of a very short amount of time, Job loses his entire family, all of his children, his grandchildren, everyone except for his wife, which you think might be a blessing until she turns to them and says, why don't you just curse God and die? And you're like, wow, okay, that's not real nice. Um, So that's who's left of his family is his wife who's telling him that message, right? He loses all of his, his income, his, his value in life, right? Like his livestock and his property, all those things that we, we kind of get our value from in life. He loses all of that. It's all gone. And Job, I'm sure in that moment, is sitting there and thinking, why God? And then his friends show up. And you're like, oh, good. His friends are here. They can comfort him. They'll be, you know, good influence in his life. And we see for several chapters, his friends bring arguments to Job trying to address his suffering and and help him in this situation. And it's interesting, as his friends are speaking in Job, um, the way that they come to try and comfort him is they bring a perspective on Job's suffering that I think many of us probably share a lot of times when we face suffering. And that is suffering is punishment, right? If we face suffering, we must have done something to deserve that suffering. And so that's the perspective that his friends bring to, to Job. Now, that's not wrong, necessarily. You know, the Bible tells us that God disciplines us because he loves us and things like that. And so sometimes in life, we do face suffering because of our sin or because of consequences of our sin and things that we have done to kind of deserve the suffering that we face, right? But in Job's case, the Bible's pretty clear that that's not the the truth, right? It says at the beginning of Job that he was a pretty upright and blameless guy, And that all the suffering that happens is because of this conversation that's going on in heaven that Job and his friends have no idea about. They don't know what's going on up there. All they know is Job is facing all of this suffering. And so as they're trying to help Job cope with the suffering, they're just, they're pushing him because they think that Job is hiding something. And they're like, Job, just admit what you've done that's wrong and ask for forgiveness from God and then he can restore you. Come on, Job, why are you fighting this so much? And Job, all the way through chapter 19, keeps maintaining his innocence. Um, I also want to point out, too, that suffering is not always punishment. Um, We see in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, Paul actually says this about suffering. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. And so the, you know, if you do math, right, like if A equals B and B equals C and C equals E, then A equals D in the end, right? So we see here that suffering actually leads to hope. Paul's saying suffering leads to hope. Well, that's a really interesting take on it. I mean, that's not, doesn't sound like a punishment to me. Usually punishments don't lead to hope. Punishment leads to change but not necessarily hope. But we see here that Paul is saying very clearly, no, suffering does ultimately produce hope in us. And so I want to unpack that a little bit this morning and see how that can be. So theologically, yes, suffering can be punishment, but suffering is not always punishment. That's the first point I want you to take away this morning. Suffering is not always punishment. So if you are facing suffering in life, it is not necessarily because you have done something wrong. 
Again, sometimes that is true, but it's not always the case. And so the question of why God, the truth of the matter is that we don't know. Even in the story of Job, he and his friends didn't know. They could not answer that question of why God. Only God knows the answer to why we go through suffering. And so if we can't find the answer, if God's not telling us the answer, sometimes maybe he tells us why suffering happens. But as we read through the rest of the story of Job, you'll see that God doesn't really answer that question. He never tells Job the conversation that happened in heaven. He doesn't tell Job about why he suffered through all these things. And so if we can't answer that question, um, that can be difficult in life, right? I know a lot of people who go through suffering, even people who are not necessarily believers, ask the question of why God. I remember um, many years ago now, it's probably 10 or 15 years ago, um, we had a neighbor who was not a Christian, not a believer, but my mom had built a relationship with her. She was a little bit older lady, and as during the time that we knew her, her husband passed away. And I remember my mom telling me one day that she had had a conversation with this lady, and even though the lady was not a believer, wasn't a Christian, she was asking the question of why God in the midst of her suffering, because she loved her husband dearly and it was a very hard loss for her. And so she was asking that question. And again, my mom couldn't necessarily give an answer to that question. And so if we can't answer the question of why God, I think there's a better question maybe that we can answer that will help us to be at peace with the fact that we can't answer the question, why God? Oh, and this too. So when we're asking the question of why God too, um, I think it's important to understand that when we ask that question of why God, I think often we are actually saying to God, God, if I was in control, I would have done something differently. I know better than you do, God. And so I just want to encourage us in that to submit and be humble before God, because the truth is that that's that's a lie, right? Like, we don't know better than God does. He knows better than we do, and there's a reason that he is in control. And so if we can't answer the question of why, God, I think the question that we can answer that will help us Be at peace with not knowing why things are happening is the question, can I trust God? Because if we can trust God, then why things are happening isn't as important anymore, right? If we know that we can trust God, then we can allow him to be in control even when we don't understand it. And if we can't trust God, well, then there's not much hope left for us, is there? And so I want to unpack the question of, Can we trust God? And I think we find the answer here in the verses that we read this morning. Looking back at verse 25, I love that this verse is in the book of Job. Job says to his friends, the answer for the reason that he still has hope, that he doesn't curse God and die like his wife said, in the midst of this tremendous suffering is because of this. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. So in the midst of all of his suffering, Job has hope because he is looking forward to a redeemer that he knows is going to come. He has faith in that. And what's incredible is historically, Job is actually probably one of the earliest stories in the Bible. It was actually written probably before Genesis was even written down by Moses. And so Job was long, long before Jesus. This is not somebody who has the hindsight to look back on who we now know is the redeemer, which is Jesus Christ. But he was looking forward, trusting that God was going to send a redeemer that was going to be victorious. And because of that, Job could have hope. And the great thing for us is now we have hindsight. We can look back on scriptures and know that the redeemer that Job is talking about here is Jesus. The same Jesus that we love and we worship. And for the same reason that Job had hope back then, we can have hope even in the midst of our suffering today. So the question then that we're addressing in, the, in these couple weeks leading up to Easter is how can we have grace and suffering or the topic of grace and suffering? And so I just want to give a couple of real practical things that hopefully will help you in the midst of suffering or the next time you face suffering or somebody that you love faces suffering to face that with grace, the same way that Job faced his suffering with grace. So the first one I think we find in John 16, verse 33. This is actually Jesus speaking to his disciples very uh, right before he goes to the cross. And he's told them that he's going to the cross at this point. He's told them that he's going to leave. And they're kind of freaking out. (laughs) And he says to them, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. 
but take heart, I have overcome the world. You may have heard that verse before, but I want to focus on the fact that Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. That's a promise. That's a, that's a concrete statement, a promise that Jesus is making. And we know that Jesus fulfills his promises, right? And so we know for sure that we will face trouble in this world. And so I think the first thing that we can do to have grace when it comes to suffering is we can expect it. Don't be surprised when suffering comes along. When it happens, it's going to. Like, it's, Jesus promises it's going to happen. There's no doubt that we will face suffering in this life. The second thing I think we can do is to ask the right questions when we are facing suffering. So instead of asking the question, why God, which we often gravitate, I know, again, I've asked that question many times in my life, I think the better question that we can ask when we face suffering is who is our hope in? Because if we can remember who our hope is, then the question of why doesn't need to be answered. We can just simply trust God that he is in control and he knows what is best even when we don't understand it. And again, Job says this in verse 25. And I love, uh, I don't know if your Bible is like mine. I have a bunch of footnotes. It's like a study Bible, right? But if you look in your Bible, it might have a note in there for verse 25 that says it can actually be translated a different way, which I think is even more powerful than what this says, which is this way. You just change those little words. It says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on my grave. Oh, wow, what a picture that is of what Jesus actually did, right? The picture there is that the Redeemer is standing victorious over the grave. And we know that that's true. We look back on what Jesus did. Jesus conquered death. He resurrected from death. And so Job is saying here, even thousands of years before knowing who the Messiah was going to be, before knowing Jesus, that his hope is in the resurrection of the Redeemer. Well, that's the same place that we can find our hope, right? That's why I think we can relate so well to this story in Job is because our hope comes from the same place that Job found his hope. So we get this picture here of the Redeemer conquering the grave, but we know Scripture tells us that Jesus also conquered sin. And so our ultimate hope, and I think Pastor Joe kind of preached my sermon for me this morning, uh, but our ultimate hope is in the fact that we have a future after this life. You know, the Bible talks about that this life is like a vapor, And I know oftentimes we don't live in that perspective, right? We live like this is all that there is, and we put so much emphasis and focus on this life. And so that makes it so when we face suffering, it hurts a lot. Because we feel, even if we don't think this way, we feel like this is it. But the truth of Scripture is that that's not the case at all. That we have a future and a hope for eternity beyond this life. That this life is a blip compared to that. And that eternity, like Pastor Joe shared is going to be filled with no suffering. Revelation talks about that Jesus, when he comes back, is going to wipe every tear away. There's going to be no more suffering, no more pain in the world when we get to that point. And so if we live with that in mind and that perspective, rather than feeling like this day is the end of the world, we can understand that this day is a very, very small thing in the midst of an eternity of hope and peace and love and joy with God face to face. And so because Jesus conquered the grave, and because he conquered sin, we know that we have that hope. So a couple of takeaways this morning. Oops, not quite there yet, sorry. A couple of takeaways this morning, if you are facing suffering, or when you do face suffering. Because again, Jesus promises that we will face suffering. So the first thing is, again, expect it. And even though we don't know why things happen all the time, God knows that. And because we know him, we know that we can have hope in the midst of those sufferings. And we know that we can trust him because he loved us enough to send his own son for us, to die for us himself. Nobody else has done that for us, but Jesus did. He paid the ultimate price for us and laid down his own life, and then he resurrected. And so we know, like Paul says in Romans, that because of his death and resurrection, we can look forward to the same that we can die to ourselves today and we can resurrect ultimately for eternity with him. So the challenge that I want to give you this week and going forward as you face suffering is to live in the hope of Christ. And I think Paul summarizes this well in Romans 8, verse 18. 
Again, Pastor Joe stole my sermon, but uh, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed in us one day when Jesus returns. So look forward to that hope. Live in that hope. Even when we're facing suffering today, keep things in perspective. Let's pray.